Welcome to another episode of the Cannabis Review. I am delighted to be joined on this show by Dr. Emmanuel Oninvi. He is a professor at uh, William Patterson University in New Jersey. How are you keeping, Emmanuel? Fine. With this COVID, COVID life that we are all getting used to. I got my two vaccines already. Okay, you're one of the lucky ones now. You'll be on a, a foreign holiday, send some sunshine for yourself soon. In fact, I'm giving a seminar in Puerto Vallarta, in Mexico, on the International Behavioral Neuroscience Society. And of course, my symposium with four others from Japan, from Mexico, and from Spain, we are all going to be talking about the advances in, in the, especially the CB2 receptor research. With that, I'm delighted to have you on the show to talk about these topics. Do you want to give people briefly uh, a little overview on your work in the cannabis industry so far and how you ended up uh, in William Patterson University? It's a long story, but I'll try to cut it short. So I finished my PhD from the University of Bradford in England in neuropharmacology. I moved directly to the United States to do my postdoctoral fellowship in the, in the laboratory of the very prominent scientist, his name is Dr. Billy Martin, of, unfortunately he's diseased. And we worked especially on the cannabinoid system. And for 30 years now, I've been hooked on this cannabinoid system research. And it has led to a number of numerous discoveries, not just by my group, but by others that I've worked with in the past, including the cloning of the CB1 receptors, the identification of different systems that are involved in the effect of cannabis that has shed a lot of light in the mechanism of action of cannabis and the fact that the body, the human body, makes its own natural marijuana-like substances that are called endocannabinoids. And I would, um, and, um, um, I would um, in, during this presentation, I will make more uh, uh, addition to this endocannabinoid system. Amazing, brilliant. Well, I'm delighted to have you on the show. As I said, I've done research on uh, your work so far. And as I said, you're one of the gentlemen that I've been looking forward to chatting to uh, by having this show. So I'm basically going to get, I'm just going to ask you a quick question before we kick off. Over in Ireland, we had this uh, lobbying group who are anti um, cannabis, who basically came out saying that cannabis is the biggest danger to children's mental health of the next 10 years. Do you think this is a rubbish statement with somebody with the level of education that you have? It's a very good question because yes, why marijuana, the, the science as you are going to hear me talk about today um, has exploded and we have significant new knowledge. And some of these myths and stigma that still revolve around marijuana because of prejudice and prohibition, that cautionary statement is correct and that is children should not be exposed or pregnant women should not be exposed to cannabis. Why? Because the brain is still developing. But for adult use, the current explosion of cannabis use across the globe, and it is very important for those advocates to know that no one anymore can stop the use of cannabis as medicine and as recreational use. However, you must also add that this is not for children because their brain is still developing. This is not for pregnant women at this time. But, but paradoxically, I will show you that even in the, 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 the marijuana system or the cannabis system called endocannabinoid is intricately involved in reproduction, is intricately involved in, in growth of the newborn. And therefore, this current knowledge, new knowledge, allows, there's no medicine without side effect. So it allows the use of cannabis but with stipulation that this is not for uh, for children and this is not for pregnant women. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much for clearing that up. Can you tell the audience a little bit about the advances in cannabis research? Things seem to be going on leaps and bounds as new R&D happens in the industry. So as somebody's at the tip of the spear of this sector, what would you see as the new advances that we can look forward to seeing? There's a lot of advances. In fact, it's explosive. The reason for this is that uh, these advances in cannabis research had lagged behind other natural abuse drugs like morphine, like cocaine, like tobacco, because of years, years of prejudice and prohibition. Now there has been an explosion, as we said earlier, 
of new knowledge on cannabis research, and it has been transformed into mainstream science, not just mainstream science, but also in Main Street. And the stigma is being shared, as I mentioned earlier, at breathtaking speed. This new knowledge, these new advances include one, the decoding of the cannabis plant genome. With the decoding of the cannabis plant genome, what that means is that you can now be able to, to, to cultivate cannabis depending on what you want to use it for. Of course, I will talk a little bit about CBD also. The second major discovery, apart from the human genome that is also being decoded and mapped, the next major discovery, which is almost 10 years old now or more, is the discovery of the, that the human body makes its own natural cannabis-like substances that are referred to as endocannabinoids, first discovered in Israel. Anandamide was first of these substances discovered. Anandamide is a Sanskrit word meaning eternal bliss. And furthermore, 2-AG, 2-arachidonic glycerol, another cannabis-like substance was also discovered in the human body. And it became very clear that there is no cell in your body. There is no system in the human biology that does not involve this natural endocannabinoid system, even, um, um, even you and me. So let me give you the first example. One, during fertilization, for the sperm to fertilize the egg, you require this natural endocannabinoid to pierce through the egg and fertilize the egg. Once that egg is fertilized, that egg travels through the fallopian tube and anchors in the uterus, and the cell starts to divide in biology. For that cell to implant an anchor in the uterus, you require this natural marijuana-like substances, these endocannabinoids, okay? At that critical time, as I mentioned already, during implantation, if a woman smokes marijuana, there might be uh, uh, the propensity for miscarriage. So what I'm telling you right now is that an appropriate level, a balanced level, a homeostatic level of this natural marijuana-like substances is very important for appropriate pregnancy for you to be born or for me to be born. And when that baby is finally born, guess what? The breast milk is now loaded with this natural cannabis-like substances to do what? To give the baby appetite, appetite to feed and grow. In summary, what I just told you is that this new discovery of this endocannabinoids that is important and involved in all types of our cellular component is very, very important. Yes. Well, uh... Please if continue you want on. More, do you want more? The cloning <laughs> and the of cannabinoid receptors. We can go to that next. Yeah, hit us up. Right. So the next one in terms of cannabinoid receptors is the cloning and the characterizations of cannabinoid receptors. This is another significant advancement because it became clear that the receptors that are activated, that are turned on by these cannabis-like substances and the the exogenous, the marijuana-like substances, because the marijuana-like substances include, I mean, cannabis-like substances, you can exchange, exchange the two. The, cannabinoid, the cannabis plant contains over a hundred, let's just put it, over a hundred chemicals, including the tapins, including the flavonoids. And this has been now well studied because the major psychoactive component of cannabis is called THC. They are called cannabinoids. And that is why the one made by the human body is called endocannabinoids. And then many of these compounds have been characterized and classified, including CBD. CBD is referred to as cannabidiol, which is now gaining a lot of attention across the globe. However, these receptors, the major ones that have been characterized so far is referred to as CB1 cannabinoid receptors. It turned out that the CB1 cannabinoid receptors is the most abundant binding site the most abundant protein produced in the human brain and testes and the uterus. And therefore they play a very significant physiological role. What has been controversial was the discovery of the CB2 where it became very prominent. The CB2 receptor was pre previously cloned by Monroe in England. And when they cloned the CB2 cannabinoid receptors, it was not found in the brain. And therefore it, for many years, it was thought that it was not in neurons, neurons in the brain. But here was my major discovery that yes, this CB2 receptors is also in neurons and it's also in microglia cells, the immune cells of the brain. 
And therefore, this has changed now the, that controversy, that con cannabinoid controversy. And this is why I'm very happy to be involved in any type of controversy at all in the globe, especially <laughs> if you turn out that you are correct. <laughs> Otherwise, one more point about cannabinoid receptors, because there are many now that we are discovering, they are called um, putative cannabinoid receptors. Perhaps there will be CB3, CB4, CB5, but the, between the CB1 and CB2, there are subtypes, subtypes of cannabinoid receptor, 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, depending on the species, depending on which animal. And the CB2 also in mice and humans that we use for, for studies, there's also CB1A and CB1B. Uh, for that characterization. One more advancement that is surprising to me is that you know yeast, right? Yeast is used to make bread, right? Yeast is used to make beer that a lot of people like to consume. Guess what? Now yeast can be used to make, to genetically engineer cannabinoids for cannabis-based medicine for the future. That's another yeah. significant advancement, an exciting science actually. Wow. Well. Amazing. Well full of information so far. You are. We're meant to do 15 minutes. I have a funny feeling we'll be going longer than this with you. <laughs> I think we'll move on to the next topic is basically something that I'm sure a lot of people think they know about. But how does cannabis affect our bodies? This is a very good. Um, this, is, this, this is one of the significant advances that has led for cannabis now that has unraveled our eyes for cannabis to be used, not just for medicine, but also for recreation. Medically, as I said, there's no part of the human biology and physiology that, that does not have this cannabis system, this endocannabinoid system. And therefore, when the level is too high or too low, especially in psychiatric issues, you can see the involvement of this system, whether it is too low or too high, that the, it needs to be brought to a homeostatic level. And therefore, you can see that there's a lot of, lot of application in the way it affects the human body for medicinal use, whether it is for anxiety, whether it is for depression, for example. And one of the other major issues and the discovery is the, what we call myths and stigma that surrounds the use of cannabis. One prominent one is the fact that men that who use marijuana or who use cannabis, if I want to stick with cannabis, Okay. May, may have low sperm count. What we now know anecdotally and from many other scientific uh, research in the United States is that actually sperm count is increased in men that use cannabis. And I just went over also how fundamentally it is very involved in reproduction in our bodies, reproduction between the sperm. It's called acrosome reaction in the body. When the sperm fertilizes the egg, as I said earlier, it is called acrosome reaction. The head of the sperm, the, the, the sperm is carrying like a helmet. And then when it pierces through the egg, it, 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 it delivers the genetic material from the sperm to the egg. And then that fusion, that fertilization, when, when it occurs, indicates the, the, the undeniable use of, canna, of cannabis for reproduction by the human body. And that is why when there is... Um, 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 homeostatic imbalance, homeostatic imbalance, then there could be miscarriage. There are other uses, including bone, for example, in bone health, including um, skin. And now, as you are going to see in the future, the recreational use is beyond anyone to stop. Especially, I think maybe this is the most important component in the legalization for recreational use as well as, as, well as uh, medicinal use. One, there will be a quality control in Canada. The whole of Canada, marijuana is now legal, even in, in, the, in supermarkets where you can go to get whatever type of cannabis because there are different types, right? There are different types of cannabis. The cannabis sativa, the cannabis indica, and there are subspecies. So, so the care that is important is that when there is quality control, then you cannot just be using cannabis that is illegal. Because if you go out to the streets to just get any type of cannabis now, you don't know what is laced with it, what is accompanying that cannabis. So that means the regulation and the quality control is very important for the medicinal as well as recreational use. One other example is that there is something called epileptic seizures in children. In epileptic seizures, there is the Dravet syndrome. 
the Lennox Gastet syndrome. And in this syndrome, in children, two years old, the United States of America, the FDA has approved Epidiolex, or, or the CBD in particular, for the use in childhood epileptic seizures. Yet the federal government of the United States, it is still illegal to use cannabis uh, and, uh, for anything. But different states now have now legalized the use of cannabis uh, recreationally, about 33 or 36 and maybe about um, 11 or 12 inclusive for uh, recreational use. So yes, cannabis is very, very promiscuous. Cannabis-like substances in the human body is very promiscuous. Mexico just also approved that. Netherlands is being in use in Netherlands for different purposes for many, many years, over 40 years. And yet the whole world is now waking up that this is real good medicine, this natural medicine is important in all of our daily function. Yeah, no, well, I couldn't agree with you more. It's going to be a green wave that just sweeps the globe over the course of time. So I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us. I'm sure everybody got a, a huge amount of knowledge from that show as much as I did. I hope you have a great day, Emmanuel, and hopefully we can chat again in the future and uh, uh, see how things have progressed. You let me see this, right? I will indeed, of course. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for having uh me on your show. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Thanks, everybody. Until next time.